of relates again to, to Brian's question that he was asking earlier. Plant chloroplasts, and okay, we're focusing on this plant, are thought to have been derived through primary endosymbiosis. They're going to have only two membranes. Okay, if you go to a plant, that came from green algae, they fall into that category. And it's just that next step going So here's, here's what happened. We had this one event in time, and where we had an ancestral eukaryote cell that took in this photosynthetic bacteria, right, it evolved uh, over time and became reduced uh, to form, to lose its independence and form into the chloroplast. And then structurally later, and evolutionary changes happened that led to some slight differences in what was going on with the red algae versus the green algae. But they both got these chloroplasts from this event right here, from that ancestor. Right, this happened one time, and then this ancestor then passed that trait to all of its descendants. Now compare that to what is thought to have happened with secondary endosymbiosis, with all these other protozoans that have have chloroplasts in them. Right, chloroplasts that are acquired by secondary endosymbiosis are thought to have multiple origins. That previous example I showed you was homology. You have a similarity between red algae green plants and land plants because they had an ancestor that had this characteristic and it passed it on to all of them. They share a shared ancestry. Have that had that in their anatomy. But if we look at all these different lineages of protists, you're going to find that they have very, very structurally different chloroplasts than plants do, and algae do. Right? And if you go into them, you'll find that this actually evolved from a, an ancestral cell engulfing a green algae at one point in time and another ancestral cell over here engulfed a different green algae at a different time. That led to the chloroplasts and euglenids. Then we have over here an ancestral uh, uh, eukaryote that engulfed a red algae, and that would uh, have structurally different uh, chloroplasts than green algae. And that then evolved into the chloroplasts that we see in these lineages right here, including our apical complex and the ciliate dinoflagellates and chromatiles. Right, all of those are, are completely separate events. We have three different events here. That's just, that's just the start of it. And three different events here that led to these different chloroplasts that we see in these different protist lineages. So we're going to actually look at this in relation to the cladogram right, that we're going to focus on here for, for green plants. Remember, we were looking at originally the tree of life. So I'm going to show you the tree of life again. And I'm going to show you where these events occurred. And so you may feel for this. And then I'm going to show you where the land plants go to and how it relates to the of the virus. Okay, so here is going to be our tree of life. We've got our three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. They've just taken that one branch of eukarya and they've spread it out so you can see all the different groups that are in there. So we've got our fungi, for example, our animals over here. We're going to have a bunch of uh, protist lineages that are mixed around in here. And we get over here, we're going to start getting into our green algae, red algae, and our, our plants, land plants over here on the side. Right here in evolutionary history, remembering that as you go backwards, in a cladogram, go from the tips right here downward, you're going into the past. Right? The further down you go in the tree, the further in the past you're going. So down here is where that primary endosymbiosis event occurred, right? where a cyanobacteria was engulfed by a eukaryotic cell that formed into a chloroplast. Right? That led to the, as you can see, the chloroplast that we see in both red algae and green algae. And since land plants are descended from them, it's also applied to the land plants. Right? That's the first event happened. Then you see after that occurred, right here, now this ancestral cell here now has a chloroplast in it. Because there's where it was acquired, this ancestor has a chloroplast. So it was either a red algae or a green algae here that was then engulfed by this ancestor right here that led to the chloroplast that we see in this group. You see another one over here engulfed one of these ancestors as well that led to a different chloroplast in this lineage right here. And then we had another event completely separate over here with this ancestor engulfed a red or green algae and it led to their chloroplast. So you can see how this one event is into branches. It's homology, whereas we've got separate tick marks right here that represent homoplasy, convergent evolution. We kind of were harking back to our previous lecture and seeing how this is connected to what we were talking about before. Okay. Yes? So is there any particular reason why for primary endosymbiosis, there was a single event, but for secondary symbiosis or endosymbiosis, there was multiple different events. Because these right here are basically a result of this, right? This had to happen first before these things can even happen. What the better question might be in that case is why didn't we have some other events over here where cyanobacteria or cardiobacteria were taken up? That's a good question. 
Okay, but remember, homoplasia or convergent evolution is not real common. It's, it's unusual for you to have the same event happen and multiple times at different, different places and get the same or similar result from that. Okay, so convergent evolution is not real common. Homology is. Okay, so this is actually kind of more unusual right here than having just a single event right here. So we have the better question is why do these all happen separately at different times and have the same thing with this new chloroplast develop in these other organisms through convergent evolution? So, yeah, but that one had to happen first. You had to have that first event first, otherwise you can't get those secondary nucleoses because you have to have that algae form before you can get a chloroplast with three or four membranes in it. That has to be it has to be algae that's doing the stem cells. That's something that I do want you to know. Okay, for each of these different processes of symbiosis primary and, and secondary, what was engulfed? Okay, specifically, what was engulfed? Okay, for primary in so in, in the symbiosis, it was going to be a cyanobacteria, and for secondary, it was either a red algae or a green algae. It just depends. It depends on which secondary in the symbiosis event you're looking at. One of, some of them were for green algae, or a green algae was being engulfed, and some were red algae. Okay. All right, so that's what the little stars mean right there. That means it's secondary in the symbiosis. Right. Now, if we go back over here to this branch, this right here is the, the branch that we want to focus on for this chapter. Okay? These are what are referred to as the green plants. And I hate that common name because it includes more than just plants. It can include algae in it as well. But we'll get to that in a second. So let's look at that, that branch right here. And we're actually going to take that one little line there and we're going to expand it out. Okay? So here is our green plants branch right here. We've spread it out now so that we can see all the different lineages on that. We're ignoring all the rest of the tree of life. And so all this direction, we're just kind of taking that off and just looking at this branch right here. And you can see that the green plants are formally called the bitter de plantae. Sometimes people just cut that off and say plantae. That's probably the kingdom we've heard of before, kingdom plantae. That's exactly what we're looking at. We're looking at a kingdom here, and this is our kingdom. Sometimes it's also called chlorobiota. It's kind of an older name, but you will see your book kind of use these two terms interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Green plants also mean the same thing. It's just that's the common name. This is the scientific name. And the beard of plantae includes what are called green algae. And there's a reason that's in quotation marks. Anything I put in quotation marks is going to be some sort of a paraphyletic group, not a monophyletic. So we've got our green algae, and you can see why it's a paraphyletic group. That's all of this right here, okay? This kind of side branch that you see off of the, the main cladogram right here. Those are the green algae. And then you have a monophyletic group over here that is gonna be the embryophytes and the land plants, okay? We'll focus on them a little bit later. Okay? That's the next group we're gonna get into after this one. Right now, we're gonna focus just on the green plants as a whole. Now, down here at the bottom, remember, this is a clade. The green plants is a clade, all of this right here is clade. So if you want to find if there are any shared derived traits for a clade, you have to go down below where that, that common ancestor is, that node is, and look for tick marks that are down here. You can see we've got four, right? Four different traits that define this particular clade of group of organisms. These are the hypothesized shared derived traits for the bearded plantae. We'll list them first, and then we're gonna go through them and look at them individually. First, they have cell walls that are made of cellulose. Why is that important? A lot of different types of organisms have cell walls. Fungi have cell walls. Bacteria have cell walls. Archaea have cell walls. They're all made of different stuff. The ones from fungi are made of chitin. If you look at um, the bacteria, they're made of peptidic lichen. Archaea is made of pseudopeptidic lichen. They're not made of cellulose. Okay, so this is kind of unique. Having a cell wall is not unique. What it's made of is. That's the important part to know that. Number two, they're going to have an accessory pigment, chlorophyll B. Number three, this is going to relate to the structure of their chloroplast. Okay. Even though red algae, green algae, both acquired their chloroplast from that same primary endosymbiosis event, okay. they do have different structural structures inside of their chloroplast. In the green plants, you're going to find something called thylakoid membranes that are stacked into granite. They're kind of like stacks of pancakes okay, inside the chloroplast and arranged in a specific way. You don't see that in red algae or the other protist groups for that matter. And then number four, true starch storage compound. How they store their food. What molecule are they going to store it in? All right, 
let's start off with number one. Cellulose wall made of or cell walls made of cellulose. Okay. First of all, what is cellulose? Okay, well, cellulose is a polysaccharide, meaning it's a complex sugar. Okay, not a small sugar, it's a big sugar. It's made up of a bunch of glucose subunits. So glucose, if you recall, is the ending product of photosynthesis. It's the, it's the main product that they want. Oxygen's the byproduct. As much as we like it, that's not the main goal of photosynthesis. The main goal is to make glucose. But they may not necessarily use that energy right away. Right? And when they store it, they store it in bigger chains. They group these, these glucose units together. Each one of these is a single glucose unit right here. They link them together into these chains right, right here. And that's going to be starch. Right? But they also use some of this glucose to form chains that make something called cellulose. These two molecules are going to be super similar. Starch and cellulose are both going to be made of glucose, right? Chains of glucose. It's how they're arranged that's important, right? In the case of cellulose, there's a specific type of bond called a beta 1 4 bond, which just means that there's a specific angle, right? In this orientation, in, the, in this bond right here between individual glucose subunits right here, and it's arranged in a way that it does not break down very easily. Okay? There's a reason why it doesn't break down very easily. This molecule is supposed to be for structural support. Okay? What these things do is they get secreted outside of the plasma membrane as something called microfibrils. So a microfibril is basically a fiber-like strand that's made up of glycoproteins, so sugar proteins, right? and cellulose. So it's taking these strands of cellulose and kind of gluing them together. They sort of get twisted and they kind of aggregate and form into these microfibrils that get secreted outside the plasma membrane. And then eventually they'll get they'll form into even bigger fibrils and form a kind of mesh-like network. Right? So it's just like you kind of have a net inside of the cell wall. And it's very supportive because this is a very strong molecule. It gives rigidity to the cell. And one of the things it does help with is it makes sure that the cell doesn't burst when it fills with water. Because plants do take in a lot of water. They have vacuoles inside of them. This big structure here, this right here. That can hold water. And as it fills with water, you get some more and more water in there. Water pushes against the plasma membrane. There's nothing there to hold that in. The plasma membrane can burst. So if you get the cell wall there, that provides some rigidity. It's called a turgid cell. It's one of the way, main ways that non-woody plants actually can grow upright. It's one of the, one of the things that helps with that. So this is not easily broken down. It has everything to do with how those glucose molecules are bonded together. We're going to come back to this in a second when we get to starch. Okay, second characteristic. The green plants are gonna contain chlorophyll B. They also have chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A is actually their main pigment. That's the one they have in the highest abundances. But having chlorophyll A is actually really not that unique. It is by far the most common pigment out there. A lot of other kinds of plants, or a lot of other kinds of organisms have chlorophyll A as well, okay? But you don't usually have just one pigment if you're a photosynthetic organism because each pigment is only able to capture certain wavelengths of light. So if we look at chlorophyll A here, you can see what's restricted to. Mostly the blues that you see over here, kind of a purplish blue color, that's a wavelength that it can catch. And over here in the reds, right? it cannot catch anything in the greens. That's why the plants are green. They reflect that light, they don't absorb it. Right? That's, that's wasted the energy. That's energy they can't capture from the sunlight. Right? They can't capture it and they can't use it if they can't, if they don't think that they can absorb it. But if you only have one pigment, you're restricted to that. That's as efficient as you can do with photosynthesis, and that's not very efficient. Not that organisms are very efficient, but if you have what are called accessory pigments, which are additional pigments in lower quantities, they may have slightly different peaks as to what wavelength they will capture. And you can see that even though chlorophyll is a chlorophyll, right? chlorophyll B is a chlorophyll, it does have a slightly different peak to it than chlorophyll A. So if it has both of these, it can capture a little bit more energy in the process of photosynthesis. Okay? So what's unique about this? If you go to other photosynthetic organisms, we'll use red algae and brown algae as an example, because this, the one we're talking about, is we're talking about includes green algae. So let's look at the red and the, and the brown algae. They also have chlorophyll A. Both of them have that. Not unique. Okay? But their accessory pigments are different. For this one, red algae have chlorophyll B, 
as well as something called phycosilicin. That one's kind of important too, because it can capture deeper wavelengths of light. These red algae can actually live deeper in the water than other types of algae because of that accessory thing, because they can utilize the lower wavelengths that get deeper in the water that chlorophyll can't catch. And that's all that some of these other organisms have, right? It's what gives them their red color. The more of that they have, the darker red they look. And then you have red algae down here that have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll C. So their accessory pigment mainly is C. They also have things like carotenoids or fucsodanthin is another one that they have as well. So it's really not just chlorophyll A that's unique. It's the combination of these two. The fact that they have both A and B is what makes them unique. A and B. Okay, next. This is gonna do with the structure of their chloroplast. Inside of the chloroplast, we're gonna have these membranes right, that are responsible for uh, capturing the sunlight. This is, this is these, these are the two membranes we talked about just a second ago. Here's is what we refer to as the inner membrane. That was the original membrane that was around the cyanobacteria. This outer one that you see right here, right, that's gonna be the one that formed when that original cell engulfed it. That's this one right here. And when that first eukaryotic cell engulfed it, so we've got our two membranes around our chloroplast. But inside here, we have something referred to as the thylakoid membrane. That's where all the pigments are. Right, that's where all the photosystems are. That's what's capturing the sunlight right there. And you can see these thylakoids, that's what they're called, things that look like the poker chips. Right? They are going to stack one on top of each other, and this one stacks the pancakes right here, into a structure that's called a grana. So each of the stacks is a grana. Each of the individual poker chips, or each individual pancake, is a thylakoid. We don't see that, even in the red algae which also got their chloroplast from that same primary osmosis that don't have this, which is unique. Inside of the chloroplast, besides the thylakoids and the grana, you're also gonna have fluid substance that's kind of mixed around all of this matrix right here that's referred to as the stroma. That's actually where the dark reactions, I'll use the quotation marks, dark reactions occur. White reactions are on the thylakoid membrane. The dark reactions are gonna happen in stroma. Outer membrane and inner membrane. <laughs> Although I'll take it because some of the other names they come into are, are a bit out there. What they should do is just mess you up and make the inner one be the outer one. The outer one. Yeah. All right. Number four, how they store their food. They store their food as starch. So remember, when they do photosynthesis, they're making these glucose molecules. If they don't use it right, right away, they're going to want to store that. Right? And so they don't store it as individual glucose molecules. They take those and they chain them together into a molecule that's called starch. And you'll notice that the definition here of starch is exactly the same as it was for cellulose. It is a polysaccharide, meaning it's a complex sugar, made up of glucose subunits. That's exactly what cellulose was. Right? And superficially looking at it, they look pretty much the same. The difference here is that bond, again, that occurs between the glucose subunits. Right here, right here, so on and so forth. Right, this is going to be what we refer to as an alpha-1-4 bond. I don't have to get creative enough to know that, just know it's a different bond. But the way it's angled, which is actually going to be vertically, straight up and down, actually makes this a stronger molecule. Right? There's a slight difference in the chemical bond orientation that links those glucose molecules, and it makes it difficult for cellulose to be broken down, it makes it easy for starch to break down. Why do you want to break down starch? This is your food. You gotta be able to break this down. If you couldn't break down starch, you wouldn't be able to access your energy. You want to be able to break this down. You don't want to break down cellulose, right? because cellulose is for structural support, and right? for rigidity, protection. Right? So we have one just slight difference in that bond orientation that makes one molecule easy to break down and one difficult to break down. This one breaks down easily. Now again, why is this unique? Because other organisms store food as well. Animals are a good example. 
And we actually do use a type of carbohydrate to store energy as well, but it's called glycogen, right? not starch. And if we go back again to our red algae, our, green, our brown algae here, our red algae store their sugars as glycogen as well, the same way that animals do, but brown algae store them as laminarin, which is not even type of starch. challenges to our land plants because eventually since these organisms are descended from some sort of a green algae that was aquatic that means that somewhere along the line here some sort of a transition to living on land had to occur and it's not just an instantaneous process where all of a sudden we're just going to come out of the water and we're ready to go we don't have necessarily the adaptations that we need to live on land if we've been adapted to living in the water so we're going to see a lot of adaptations as we get into some of these defining groups right, later in the semester that are exclusively land okay or came to the land first and then went back to the water that are going to be to survive on land, to grow upright, fight against the force of gravity, make sure your cells don't grow, make sure you can reproduce, all challenges that are related to living on land. Okay? But let's talk about the green algae first because it is relevant since they're the ancestors. Know that this is a paraphyletic 